Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, all of you in class, all of you are online. Welcome to a new year, new academic year. Uh, all of you are now in third year, <laughs> in case you just good morning, Chaya, good morning, Nina, good morning, everyone online and all the e learning students. Um, welcome to uh, BC 309, Urban Church Planting. Uh, Pastor, Paul, Pastor Paul Emmanuel will be teaching this course. Um, but since he had to go on an emergency, uh, I will be teaching this week and next week. Uh, just get the thing started. Uh, he, uh, he will be back on the 23rd. So from 27th onwards, he will can continue this course, right? So um, we have shared the course notes, um, and all of you here have a copy of it. Let me share it online for the benefit of the online students. And uh, we will pray and get started. All right. Um, let's take a moment to pray, and we'll get started. Father, we thank you for another new season in our lives, uh, the beginning of a new academic year. Thank you for all the students who are now in our third year, and we commit this course as we journey through this course, uh, gain insight, gain understanding. Uh, we pray you'll speak to our hearts, speak to each of us, Lord about what you would want us to do, how you'd want us to serve. And as we journey through this course, may your wisdom be given to us. May your understanding be given to us uh, so that we can be effective in serving you and serving people. We thank you, Father. Commit ourselves, uh, commit all those who are in class, online, on the e-learning, uh, that we'll all be under the covering of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so um, 309, uh, Urban Church Planting. Sometimes I'm getting confused which course I'm teaching. Uh, urban Church Planting, all right? Uh, so what, we, what, what do we want to do uh, in this course? What are we going to cover? Uh, something for us to understand is that um, we are living in a time when uh, the largest number of people who ever lived are all living on the planet at the same time you know so in one way yeah the the planet is very crowded i mean lots of people <laughs> but also means a, a lot of opportunity i mean so we are living in a time when there are so many people and that we can reach and also what is interesting is that a majority of the world's population are living in cities today. So maybe 50 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, people were, you know, more people were out in the rural areas. But with uh, cities, with the industrialization, all of that, people are moving to the cities. And it's happening even in our country, even in India. So. Uh, by 2050, I think, uh, well, by 2050, about 50 plus percent of the world's population will be in urban cities. Uh, 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 sorry, it's expected to rise to 66 percent. And even if you look at what's going to happen in India, there's sim a similar shift. So that by 2050, again, I think uh, the exact percentage is not sure, but around 60 percent of India's population will be living in the cities. So that means we are now in the middle of 2020. So in about 30 years from now, about 60% of India's population will be in the cities. You know, before we used to learn, it was 80, 20, 80% are in villages, 20% cities, then 70, 30, 70 are in villages, 30 are in cities. But now that whole thing is changing. Right? So you can imagine by the another 30 years, majority will be in the cities, 
some will be lesser population in the villages. So I'm not saying uh, rural areas are not important. What we are saying is, if people are moving to the cities, then we need to understand how to do ministry in the city, how to plant churches, how to go about doing ministry in the city, and from the city, of course, reach everywhere else. Right? Because the people and the resources are in the city. So from there, we can reach out. We can reach into towns and villages. We can do that. Right? But the other way is very difficult. Like if we are in the village, to reach the city is not so easy. Right? But going from the city, because you have people, you have resources, you can go and reach many, many places. Right? So we want to uh, uh, just share some lessons. Uh, uh, on how to plant churches, urban church planting, how to start and establish churches in the cities. And uh, uh, a lot of this we will be sharing you know, from our own journey. I'll share some personal experiences. And then, uh, but the same thing can also, the same ideas can also be used if you're going to go and start a church or a ministry in uh, a small town or even in a village, the same principles can be applied. But the reason we are saying urban is because uh, our focus has to be that now, because more and more people are moving into the cities. Okay, So um, some of the things that we will um, uh, cover, I don't know, you, okay. Uh, there are some books that you can read which are relevant, uh, APC books that you can read, and uh, some of it you may have already covered in other courses. So uh, there will be some information that, that may be familiar to you. So uh, we are going to, uh, the way we have um, set up this course, first, uh, I'll just share some, you know, my own personal journey, some experiences. First, we will look at the call, the what, what the call to the cities, and that God is interested in the cities. Understand the natural and the spiritual dynamic of the city. That means when we have to understand how is the the natural dynamics, what are what's happening in the city, but also understand the spiritual dynamics. You know how the enemy is operating, uh, as far as cities are concerned. Then we will talk about, we'll get into the details. All right. How do you actually plan uh, from a natural perspective? How do you go about planning and thinking about where to start in the city? So I'll just share some practical, we'll share some practical things. And then afterwards, we'll talk about the spiritual side. You know, how do you pray over the city? How do you do the, do the spiritual ministry in the city? And then we will close by, in, in the end of this course, uh, we'll be talking about um, you know, personal preparation. So if you feel that God has called you uh, to minister in the city, how can you prepare yourself? Uh, and especially if God has called you to start a church or some kind of a ministry, uh, how do you prepare yourself? So that's how we've broken this, the course, right? And we will cover this. So let me uh, start uh, today uh, just sharing uh, my own personal journey. And I've given you the date so that you know, I'm not making all this up. These, this, these are all uh, genuine stories. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when I, I was, I grew up in Bangalore. Uh, so, uh, during my uh, ninth to twelfth standard here, I was studying in Bishop Cottons here. Um, during those years, uh, I, I started. Uh, there was already a prayer group in my school that used to meet during the lunch break. So, think about this. Uh, in the school every day, we had a lunch break for about, I think it must have been 35 minutes lunch break or 35, 40 minutes lunch break. During that time, one of the school teachers, he started a prayer meeting. It was very informal, like nothing very formal. He would just tell the students. So we had a chapel in the school, still there in Bishop Cottons. Uh, he got permission to have a prayer meeting from the principal. So yeah, just students will just come sit and pray 15 minutes like you have your lunch then come sit in the chapel and pray now and then he will lead in a song he, sometimes we'll have singing sometimes he'll share something from the bible right so 
I don't know when he started it, but um, I know, uh, but it was through that prayer group that my life was touched. Right? It was very simple. One day my friend was saying, he's going to chapel. He asked me, you want to come with me? I said, usually during lunch break, we'll go play football, go do something. <laughs> you know, after having lunch, we'll just play something. Uh, but my friend, he, and he was a non-Christian, my classmate. So I was surprised because he is going to chapel during lunch break. And he asked me, you want to come? And, uh, and we were close friends. We, you know, we should play football together. And so I said, okay, I'll come with you. And I went with him. Then I saw the students, they were all just sitting quietly praying. So I just, you know, I don't know, I went and sat. I didn't know what to do. Uh, then this teacher was there. He saw me. So he said, you come tomorrow, I'll talk to you. So the teacher said, come tomorrow, I better go. <laughs> so I had my lunch, I went. And then he was there already. Um, then he took me to the side of the chapel, one side. And he asked me, have you, you know, have you received Jesus Christ? I said, yes, I thought I had received him you know, because I used to go to church. Then he asked me, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Uh, I had not heard about Lamb's Book of Life. So I said, I don't know. Then he, then he showed me, he turned to Revelation chapter 20, he showed me Lamb's Book of Life. Your name must be written there. So he said, you pray with me. Yeah, I will lead you in a small prayer. You pray with me. Oh, okay. So he just led a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I give my life to you. Then he prayed for me. Lord, make him a blessing, everything. Finish. I said, I didn't feel anything big, nothing. Okay, just he prayed, fine, fine. But something changed. Because from next day, I wanted to go to the chapel. You know, I just wanted to go to chapel. I don't know why. I wanted to go. Nobody was forcing me. Because every, students came on their own. They all would sit quietly, pray. Sometimes the teachers were not there. So they all just pray. Then in the end, they'll all line up, say a prayer together, and go back to class. So it was very quiet and nothing big. I used to go back and then so I started reading my Bible and you know that's how my journey began. But what I want to point out is this in a very simple way, very simple way, this teacher started a prayer meeting in the school. And not just my life, but many friends, uh, and some of them, you know, are still in touch today. They're all still walking with the Lord today. Still walking with Jesus. Of course, they are in different parts of the world. They are in, you know, doing different things in life. But simple thing, starting a prayer meeting in the school changed the lives of so many students. And many are walking with Jesus even till today. So beautiful. So you just keep that in mind. So this is like ministry happening in a city. Right? In a city school, a teacher started a prayer group. Simple, nothing fancy, but lives were being touched. People are being saved. So now my life was touched. And the good thing this teacher did was, so this was around October 1981, uh, is when my life was touched. In 19, early 1982, he also taught us about baptism and the Holy Spirit. You know, and that is a very courageous thing to do for him. Uh, but many of our students received the Holy Spirit, started praying in tongues. I also started praying in tongues. And then after that, he left school. He went abroad. So we were, you know, we lost touch. But the prayer group continued. But in 82, after that baptism, my life was so powerfully touched that I started prayer meetings in two other schools uh, in the city. And in my own school, I started another prayer meeting during the short break. We used to have a short break between 11 o'clock to 11.15. So I was running a prayer group in my own school. Then during the lunch break, I was going to two other schools. There was Bolin Boys School, that sometimes we have our, um, our Sunday services in Bing's Auditorium. So it's in that school. Uh, uh, th th that's where I, I used to go in the afternoons and uh, preach. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. To do that. And Wednesdays, I used to go to cathedral school. It's another school just on the other side of uh, near, close to Baldwin's. And again, there, students were being touched. And amazing stories, amazing stories. Even till today, uh, 
so for example in central church there's a family that's coming they've been attending church that man the father he was one of those students who used to be there in Bolan Boy School when I was preaching. So as a ninth standard, when I used to go and preach, he used to stand there. And today his son and daughter are serving in APC. <laughs> his daughter sings in the worship team. His son is, you know, with the youth. So just imagine, right? And he used to, he told me, I, 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 you know, he looks, of course, looks different today. But he told me, he said, hey, when you came to Baldwin's, I was standing there. I was listening to you. I saw you. And you know his whole life today. Now he's in church. His children are serving. You know another generation. Of course, they they young people. But you can see, you know how the the work that was done in those years, ninth to twelfth, the fruit is 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 passing on from generation to generation. Uh, I've met other people who were in cathedral school. They are now serving the Lord uh, in other places. So. That was uh, my experience in just sharing and ministering. But here's what happened. Uh, after I finished 12th grade, when I, I left Bangalore City to go to Manipal to study engineering. But when I left, what happened, um, all the groups that I, prayer groups I started, everything stopped. So uh, what I had started in Baldwin's, what I started in cathedrals, I also started another prayer group in the Methodist church. I was part of a Methodist church, and every Saturday I used to do a Bible study there. But when I left Bangalore, all those groups stopped. And I felt so bad because for three years, or more, three or more years, I had um, given my life, like really invested time. It was not easy because I was studying as a student, but I, I was doing this. And I, there was so, it was wonderful. But then when I left Bangalore, these groups stopped. And then I was thinking, what, what should I have done for these groups to continue? And that's when I realized, although nobody really told me, but I realized if you want the work to continue, you have to raise up other leaders. Then I realized, oh, that is my mistake. I did not raise up anybody to continue this work. I was doing, I had a lot of zeal. And I was doing it. But something happened in my life because now I finished 12th standard, I have to go to college. I went, when I left, everything stopped. Nobody was there to continue the work. But the fruit remained, the fruit remained. The lives who were touched, they, like, like we said, they asked, many of them are still serving God. But the work stopped. So when I went to college in Manipal, this is from uh, 86 to 94 years, I went there, uh, Manipal. I said, God, I know I have to do something here. Uh, first two years, my first year, second year, uh, I, I, I was preaching. I used to go and preach, but uh, and uh, you know, I, I held some meetings, uh, I introduced a lot of uh, people to you know to to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and so on. But it was only in my third year that I. Uh, uh, formally started a fellowship in the third year, so in Manipal. Uh, and uh, maybe I'll share a little later how, how it happened. But I went to the hotel. There was a hotel called Hotel Valley View. It's still there, I think probably running under a different name. Um, I said I want to rent the seminar hall every Saturday. Uh, I think it was 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., whatever. you know. And so from there we started. And I would go uh, put, put announcements around the campus, inviting students, sticking, you know, all these things, uh, inviting. So just, just, you know, evangelizing and getting people to come uh, to the fellowship. But now in, in Manipal, I remember this thing. I have to raise up a leader. I have to. So from the time I started, I said I knew I have only one and a half years left because uh, I started only in my uh, only in my third year. I started this fellowship. So uh, so it was only one and a half years that was that I had. I said I know before I leave, I have to find somebody who I have to train. I have to appoint so that this work can continue. 
So I was praying, God, who is this person? I need somebody here. And I was looking, and, um, and there was this person, this uh, young man, who had come to the medical college, and he had a heart for God. So I would spend time with him. And uh, in 1990, uh, when I had to leave, I handed the work over to him. But we were preparing the students, saying, hey, he's going to take over after I leave. So everybody knew. And, uh, and that work continued. So when I started, and I uh, when I started the work, maybe we had only about 30 students in that one and a half years. But he took over, and then in the next two years or so, the number just grew. Uh, and, uh, and the numbers eventually, at, at one point, it was more than 250 students worshiping God. Every every Saturday they had. Then they, it, they made it like a formally, they registered it like a church. Uh, uh, called Manipal Believers Fellowship, and they appointed a pastor, all those things that happened. But that happened after I left. So the work grew, and it just, again, through that, many, many, many students who are now, they're all over the world, but their lives have been touched. But that was also a learning experience. And this time I learned from my earlier mistake. Uh, you have to have a leader. So I passed around. Then I should tell them, you know, say, hey, you better make sure you raise up leaders because we want this work to continue. And uh, they appointed a full-time pastor. But now, sad thing happened. Uh, I think it was the year 97, 1996, 97. I forget the exact year. Uh, there was trouble between uh, the pastor whom they had appointed and some of the uh, leaders and the, the fellowship split. You know, uh, the pastor they had brought... Uh, he took he took some people. He went and started his own fellowship, and uh, the other leaders had so uh, so uh, one form of it still continues in Manipal. Uh, one of the people who were there from the very beginning, they used to attend when I was leading. Today they are leading the work. Uh, that work is still going on Manipal, but it's in a very in a very small way. So there's a sad, sad thing that happened. But again, there are lessons to learn. Some mistakes were made, which caused this problem. And I couldn't do much. I was, I was away in the US. I, I used to only you know, get some reports now and then. I was feeling very sad, because so much of effort had gone in. And you know, somewhere down around 97, like a seven years into the journey, uh, something went wrong with. And it is all, it is all about people, rela you know, people related, people couldn't get along or couldn't, uh, the relationship happened and the, the work split. So that's what happened there. But there are lessons to learn all of that. Um, then when I went to the United US to study, uh, I served in different pl uh, places. Um, I served with uh, students. Um, I actually, first I, I, in, in, in Ohio, I started again there. I started at International Students Bible Study. So I, I, while I was on campus, I noticed there was nothing done f being done for international students. A lot of what was happening was for local students, like you know, if you're from America and whatever, you have all these things. But for international students, who had, students would come in from other countries, nothing much was happening. So I got permission, registered a, a, a student group, and started uh, international students. Got permission from the college to use a, a classroom. And we started a, a international students Bible study there. Um, and then when I moved uh, to another place, I was serving with uh, a Korean Christian fellowship and also with the African American church ministering there. And then later on, um, I, I joined together with some uh, Hispanic people. These, these are Spanish speaking people who came from South America. Uh, I joined with them and we planted a church. It was a bilingual church, English and Spanish. So the songs we sing will be in English and Spanish. Messages will be translated from English to Spanish. So by this time, um, uh, I got married and Amy joined me. So we were both uh, pioneering along with another couple. So Amy and I, and there was another couple, a Spanish couple. So four of us, uh, along with, of course, with others helping, we, we pioneered this church. And um, 
after one and a half years or so, we handed it off and we moved from um, uh, New Jersey. We moved to another city, Chicago, and they continued the work. And again, that church grew, really grew wonderfully. Uh, and then while we were in Chicago, we served with a local church there. So that's been journey, you know, that's, I'm just sharing my journey. The reason I'm sharing these things is just to know, let you know that, look, uh, through all these experiences, serving in different places, whether, it, you know, in schools in Bangalore or in Manipal or in the U.S., in different, with different kinds of people, there are always lessons you learn. You learn so much, you know, by doing all this, you learn, okay, how to do, how to do it better, mistakes we make, all kinds of things were happening. You can learn lessons, and uh, I, I, you know, hopefully, we will learn these. Uh, we, uh, you know, we can learn these lessons as we go through this course. And um, then, of course, 2001 came back to Bangalore, moved to Bangalore, and started from scratch. Now, starting in Bangalore was not easy because um, uh, we had been away for 10 years. So many of the people we knew 10 years ago, they were, all of them also had gone out of the city. All you know, uh, friends. So coming back to Bangalore, um, uh, it was like okay, we had to start from scratch. You know, start from nothing, and that's literally how we started. We started uh, in a small way, in and uh, the, uh, in, the in, my, in the living room of my father's house in Natinagar. And our very first service, we had only about twelve people, you know, including the family. Everybody, twelve people. We started like that, but the vision was there. Big vision. I remember even in the very first service, I told them, we are going to have, you know, we are, this is our vision. We're going to have a church in Bangalore, uh, then we're going to impact the city, we're going to plant churches all over the city. And I remember those early days, I gave them all sign-up sheets <laughs> to be volunteers. <laughs> and we listed many ministries, none of those ministries existed, but, you know, we wanted to start. So, okay, sign up and we can start these ministries. And... Um, you know, eventually we also shared you know, how we'll have five churches. We want each church, each location to grow to 50,000 people and how we'll have. So the vision, we kept talking about it. And, 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 and you know, over time, things have happened. So we'll share some of these experiences. Okay, so that's just a little bit of background. Uh, before we get into our main lessons, uh, any questions on um, that you want to ask now? Um, and of course, you'll have plenty of time to ask questions through the course. Uh, any questions that you want to ask, even students online, uh, if you want to ask any questions before we get into our lesson number two. Any questions? Any thoughts? Uh, good morning, Pastor Ravli here. Good morning, Ravli. Your question, please. Uh, so, throughout this journey uh, from the beginning till now, uh, uh, so are there are there times that uh, um, you had doubts about what you're doing? In the sense, uh, it looks pretty clear uh, how God called you and the way you pursued and the way doors has opened. So, I would I would like to understand when. Um, when doors are not really opening in the way that you're expecting to move to the next uh, step. So how do you like, uh, how do you deal with it? How do you took it forward? Oh, could you repeat a little bit, Rowley? Um, I, I, could, I missed a little bit about what you said. Uh, uh, so throughout this journey, Pastor, uh, at times where uh, things are not happening the way they should happen or the doors are not opening. Mm -hmm. uh, I was asking you, uh, what, did it create a doubt in your head about what you're doing or uh, how do you, how did you go back to God and, uh, you know, dealt it or took it forward? Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so uh, let me just say a few things. I, I, I'm not sure if this will correctly address your question, but let me just share it, and uh, you're, you're welcome to ask a follow-up question. So uh, let me say this, that, you know, at every stage, uh, it was hard work. It was not easy. Um, there have been times, uh, both in Manipal, 
in the US and even in starting APC, when you know I, I, I preach to almost empty rooms. You know, in fact, uh, uh, for example, when when you're starting, especially in those early days, maybe two people will come, three people will come. You know, when we started APC South, I used to get up in the morning, seven o'clock, go to Jayanagar, and sometimes there there'll be two people sitting. And in my mind, I'll be thinking, God, I came all the way here. <laughs> And only two people are here. It, 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 the question is, is it worth it? You know, I remember in the US, one Bible study, nobody was there. So I closed the door and I preached, did the Bible study to the empty classroom. <laughs> I said, I came prepared. I'm leading this international students' Bible study today. And of course, you know, those there's, there's a lot of snow. People are excused, there's a lot of snow. We cannot come. Yeah, but I came in the snow to teach. <laughs> but people are not. That's okay. I'm going to speak. I close the door. I spoke to the empty classroom as though everybody is there. You know. So, so that is one kind of challenge where you have to be so. You just have to know this is what God has called you to do, and uh, uh, mentally, emotionally, you have to be strong. I remember even in APC Bangalore, when we were doing this, you know, after two years of uh, starting, we probably only had maybe, I, I don't know the exact number, but maybe around 60, 50, 60 people in church. And I was a little discouraged. And I remember especially a time, this was around two years after we started, that some, there were other people who also came to Bangalore and started churches. I, I knew at least two or three other people. And they all left. One of them went back to Canada, one of them went to Australia, another person went back to the US. They came to start work in Bangalore. They didn't see it or whatever happened, and they went back. And so in my mind, I was thinking, you know, am I do I also have to close and go? Now, these people closed and went. You know, do I also am I is this also going to happen to me? You know. Uh, those kind of questions went through my mind. But I remember at that time, I made a decision. I said, God, if I have to spend the rest of my life serving 50 people in Bangalore, I will do it. You know, So that kind of commitment you need. And it's not easy. Mentally, mentally it's, it's very challenging. Because it's easy to get discouraged, you know, especially when you're seeing other people around you. They come, they, they, they start a church uh, after two years not working out. They're close and they'll go back. And these were people I knew, or, you know, uh, and two of them were my friends, you know, uh, and one of them went to Canada, one of them went to Australia. I don't know what happened. Um, uh, but they all came to do ministry, something here in Bangalore. It didn't work out, they went. So those were, those are, that's one kind of, you know, challenge where I would say uh, uh, not doubt as much as discouragement but that discouragement can lead to doubt right like when you're discouraged you're not seeing things happen as quickly as you want you get discouraged and that could lead to doubt but that's when you have to be strong so that's uh, one uh, side of things um, that we have to uh, journey through um, the other kind of thing that I will that I also think about which might be relevant to your question is when things um, take longer than expected, uh, the timing. For example, uh, when I went to the US, in my mind, I, I knew I was going to come back to Bangalore and start a church. That vision was always there from, from the age of 15. So my plan was, okay, I will, I've, after I finished my bachelor's, the plan was, I'll go to the US, I'll do my master's, and uh, I'll come back, I'll find a job, and I'll start the church. That was the plan. So it was like a two-year plan. That was the plan. But it didn't work out that way. When I went, uh, I actually stayed for 10 years. Uh, part of the things was, you know, uh, I, uh, um, I also wanted to, uh, after going there, I realized, you know, it's not enough just get a degree. You, when uh, my mind, my thought was when I go back to India, I should have the skills I need uh, for both for business uh, and the ministry, right? 
So my part of my staying on there was, Lord, I want to acquire the skills, which when I go back to India, I will be able to do the work. So, but at the same time, I was praying. So there was the thing that I need to develop the skills, uh, which will help me both on the business side and the ministry side. And also, I was also praying, God, you tell me, give me the right time to go back. When you tell me go back, I'll go. And I should continuously pray that. So there were two sides, right? One is I, 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 I thought I'll, you know, I'll do a degree, but degree is not enough. You need the skills. You need to know how. So I am going to work and learn the skills. And I was studying churches in the US. And so both was happening, acquiring the skills. At the same time, also praying and saying, God, um, tell me what's the right, right time to go. So that took longer than expected. But I was traveling. I was ministering. Uh, I went to different parts of the world during those 10 years, uh, ministering in different parts of the world. So uh, it was not only exposure within the US, uh, but I was able to see ministry happening you know in different places uh, which was also a good training a good learning experience of which i could use all of that so when we came back to india all that skill all that learning was very useful uh, from a ministry perspective and then of course from a, a technical perspective uh, working in the us uh, you know helped me a lot uh, from a business technical perspective so so when i moved back I felt I was ready. So to, so that was the second part, which is, I thought I'll be ready in two years, but it took 10 years to actually be ready to, uh, to go back and start. So I, 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 there are no regrets about it, meaning, yeah, it took 10 years, but it was good 10 years, so a lot of learning, uh, you know, experiences. Observe, observing a lot of different churches, ministries, and different parts of the world, seeing what was happening. It was a good learning. So, um, so that, but that time sometimes can be very discouraging. And also during that time, people are giving a lot of advice. You know, I remember many people, I, I lost, I don't know the count, but many different pastors used to tell me, and of course they came with good intention. They would give advice. Why don't you just stay in america and you go minister everywhere you want you can go to india also and minister so that uh, many people gave me that advice so sometimes that can be a little distracting you know oh yeah i know i can do that but that's when you need to be convinced what does god want you to do right so whenever i heard this kind of advice i know the advice was from a good heart uh, these people meant well, they were good people. They're not saying anything bad. But that advice was not for me. In my heart, I knew very clearly, I have to be here in Bangalore and start the church and do the work here. Uh, that's what God wanted me to do as a next step. And that's what I had to do. So um, I even had offers to, you know, run a Bible college in another part of the world and uh, be run it. It's it just given to me. I said, no, I will not take it because what God has called me to do is this. So I think that that's the second aspect where there may be the training that God wants you to go through may be longer than you expect, but that's when you have to stay, stay the course. Uh, there could be nice suggestions and ideas that people give, which all is coming from a good heart, but it may not be for you. So you need to know very clearly this is what God wants you to do, and you stay the course. Um, so I hope that helps. I, I'm not sure if I really addressed your question. Uh, thanks for sharing, Pastor Ajanips. Any other questions? No? Say other, what's your question? No question. Okay, um, let's go to the next lesson. Uh, lesson number two, we'll just uh, move forward. We have still a few more minutes before the break. Let me share the screen. So, so very important. And everything we do in the ministry, 
especially when we are planning on starting a church or a ministry. We must remember that the Holy Spirit is our leader. Right? So in this course, we're going to share some very practical things. Do like this, do like that, think about this, think about that. So these are good things. They are practical things that we, you're going to learn. But remember, ultimately, the Holy Spirit must lead you. Right? So we can tell you, OK, these are all the practical things we did. Uh, these are all the practical things we are trying to do. You know, uh, We're sharing our experience. But ultimately, for each one of us, the Holy Spirit must be our leader. Right? Uh, just remind us of what certain scriptures. Acts 1.8, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So he made it very clear. Holy Spirit will come. He'll give you the power, and you'll be my witnesses. So us serving the Lord is really out of that empowering of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we are going to learn practical things. We're going to tell you about doing survey, strategizing, developing a strategy. Uh, practical things we'll share. But above and beyond all that, listen to the Holy Spirit. Right? Holy Spirit must guide you. There is no set way for every person. you know. We can learn, of course, but the Holy Spirit will lead each one of us uh, as He desires. Also, Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. You know, uh, Zechariah, he's speaking to the governor, uh, Zerubbabel. He says, Zerubbabel, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. You've laid the foundation stone, you'll also lay the finishing stone. So what had happened was, you know, this was about the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, this And uh, Zerubbabel was a governor, and there were other people, of course, all working together to rebuild the temple. They had started the work, but then for about 13 years, the work had stopped. You know, they had become discouraged, there was opposition, and uh, they had stopped the work. So remember, imagine, these people had come back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They started with a lot of enthusiasm, but now because of trouble, they had stopped. So here comes the prophet Zechariah, and there was other prophets as well. Uh, uh, Haggai was another prophet. And they were all prophesying to the people. And in, in that situation, Zechariah is saying, he's reminding Zerubbabel, it's not by might, not by power. But it's by my spirit. That means don't don't look at your own strength. You know, don't look at the army. Don't look at your strength. Don't. It's by the Holy Spirit. You have laid the foundation stone. You will also lay the capstone or the finishing stone. That means God will help you finish the work. You know, even though now it's been delayed. You know, thirteen years. They've not done anything. Go. Put your hand back to work. Uh, let your hands be strong. So. Uh, the work of God must be done with the help of the Spirit of God. Right? And um, our dependence is on God. You know, and that's something very important. You know, I can just imagine when we started All People's Church in 2001, a small group, worship team, Amy playing the keyboard, and uh, we had Brother Georgie on the guitar, only two people. Sound set, sound and setup very simple. Two mics, you know, maybe four mics, one speaker, one box, finished. Nothing complicated. Uh, you look today, you know, yeah, there's so many people have helping, lots of people doing. So it's very easy at this stage to think we don't need God. To think that yeah, people will do the work. It's very easy because everything is there. But it is in this time, in a time like this, we have to intentionally depend more on God. Yeah, You go to God and say, God, Psalm 27, verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. 
That means if God is not building the house, you do what you want. You can build a nice fancy house, but if God is not in it, not in it it's useless. No point. So unless God builds, our work is useless. It's, we are laboring in vain. It's not going to bear fruit. We can build a nice house, but what's the fruit? Will lives be touched? Will lives be changed? Will, will people be saved? Will there be fruit? Will there be lasting fruit? No. Right? So our dependence will always be on God. So even when the house has three floors, God, thank you, you brought us three floors, but you're still the builder. And we, we want to depend on you as we continue building. Yeah. Because unless the Lord builds, our labor is in vain. It's no use. Right? We have to constantly remind ourselves, go back to that place and keep ourselves in that place of depending on God. Right? So as we journey through this course about urban church planting, you're establishing a church or a ministry, whatever God has called you to do, uh, always remember, lean on God. You know, or Jesus put it like this in John 15, 4 and 5. He said, I am the wine, you are the branches. Yeah? If you don't abide in me, uh, oh, sorry, oh, let me read the exact words. Um, abide in me, for unless you abide in me, you won't be able to bear much fruit. Let me read the exact verses. John 15. Four and five. I, might, I can just paraphrase it, but abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in me. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the one, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Actually, without Jesus, you can do lots of things. Look at all the people around us. All are doing lots of things. But Everything we do without Jesus will amount to nothing. It's not going to, you know, and there are lots of people doing lots of things without Jesus. Okay, yeah, they're doing. So even ministry can happen. You know, you can use your mind. You can write books. You can preach nice sermons. You know, using your mind. Of course, God has given us a mind. You can use your mind. You can impress people. You can, so literally, you can do ministry, quote-unquote ministry, Without Jesus, use your mind, use your abilities, do it. Lots of people are doing that. But everything we do without Jesus will amount to nothing. So we have to intentionally be in that place of abiding in Jesus. Abide in Jesus, right? Because only what comes from Him is actually going to bear fruit, lasting fruit. Okay? So let's pause here. Uh, we'll go for a 10 minute break, come back, and we will continue this. All right? Thank you, everyone.